everybody. We're going to continue to explore the subject of Christian anti-Semitism and more. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, friends, to the Line of Fire broadcast. Hope you had a great weekend. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. We are going to have a really interesting show today, and there could be some very constructive fireworks in the midst of it. Uh, Reverend Ted Pike leads the National Prayer Network, uh, Christian conservative watchdog, watchdog organization, uh, he has appeared frequently before the media, dealing with lots of social and cultural issues. He and I definitely share a lot of concerns about where the culture is going, concerns about morality, concerns about homosexual activism, etc. We would be step for step in many of those concerns. At the same time, he specifically feels that Jewish people, Jewish leaders in particular, are driving the gay agenda and other negative activist agendas that are hurting our country. And as stated in his bio here, in the tradition of Christ and the Hebrew prophets, Reverend Pike is an outspoken critic of ADL, that's uh, Anti-Defamation League's evil Jewish leadership, and it goes on. So we're going to start with our areas of commonality, and then we're going to highlight our very, very different, starkly different views of the Jewish people and Israel. But we want to start with our areas of commonality before we highlight our differences. So, Reverend Pike, uh, thanks for joining us on the Line of Fire. My pleasure. Thank you, Doctor. Well, glad to have you. All right. So our areas of commonality, the concerns we have about the directions of the culture, uh, tell us about the Equality Bill and why you were so concerned about it, an issue for all of North America. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm basically uh, calling today to alert your listeners to ADL's two monster hate crimes bills, which are now rapidly moving forward in Congress. These bills would force churches to hire homosexuals and colleges, including secular and Christian colleges, to allow male homosexual transvestites to shower with girls in PE classes. Now, these bills will end free speech for Christians. And uh, if I might, I'll just, if I could just read several sentences from the beginning of an article, which I've been sending out all over the country and doing talk radio around. It's at my website, truthtellers.org. And the title of it is Equality Bill hastens Babylon the Great. And, and uh, this is a very important statement here to, to show just where hate crimes laws come from and how, how, how terribly uh, restrictive they can be upon Christian and uh, free, speech, free uh, speech thinkers, uh, even if they're secular. Just before Christmas in 1971, as Canadian federal legislatures were leaving Parliament for home, the Canadian branch of the Jewish Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, swiftly mustered passage of its national hate crimes law. Since then, the Canadian Human Rights Act and its Section 319 have proven to be an unstoppable fountain of persecution and intimidation of Canadian Christians and free thinkers. Section 319 makes it a quote-unquote hate crime for any Canadian to publicly criticize homosexuality. No pastor is allowed to read publicly any Bible passage critical of sodomy 
and express public agreement with it. If he does, he can face thousands of dollars in fines and years in prison. If a Christian is arrested for such intimidation against gays, he now faces a virtually unwinnable case in hostile provincial and federal courts. And uh, I point out that this is, this is a hate crimes bureaucracy, which is basically a speech crimes bureaucracy. Here in America, we have the First Amendment protections, which allow coarse speech, unflattering speech, uh, even, even hurtful and hateful speech, uh, just as long as it, it doesn't inflict some kind of mass hysteria like a riot or crying fire in a crowded theater. We have these rights under the Constitution. They don't have that in Canada. In Canada, if your speech is is claimed by a homosexual to intimidate him, which is which is a very subjective claim, a claim that cannot be objectively verified, it exists in his mind. He claims he's been intimidated by uh, anti or I should say homophobic hate speech, harassment whether on, on the, in the broadcast media or even in the public square or from the pulpit, then he can bring down federal prosecution on that speaker as a hate criminal. Here in America, we, we generally speaking, have the protections of the First Amendment uh, so we can speak our mind. But what ADL is wanting to do is to create in America a speech crime bureaucracy now, as, as many Christians probably know, we do have a federal hate crimes law, the Matthew Shepard Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which was passed in 2009. And I, I played an important role in, in leading uh, basically the Christian right to oppose that bill. We defeated it for almost 10 years, but it finally passed in 2009. And uh, this this federal law, even though it was... It is draconian and it is very punitive with triple penalties and so on. Nevertheless, it does not go so far as to say you can be indicted for your speech, mm -hmm. even if it does intimidate somebody. But th th there are two two laws now here that I, I've just got to bring to your attention. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that, yeah. Let me let me just jump in though. Uh, yes. In Canada, for example, national law in terms of quote misgendering someone who identifies as transgender, and, and that being a punishable crime. Uh, Professor Jordan Peterson, of course, has been addressing that plainly. You have the case of Christian activist Bill Watcott, who was yes. passing out information about a candidate saying, I want you to know that this is actually a male who identifies as female. Ultimately, he was fined $55,000 for that. There's another case now where a father has a daughter, 14-year-old Maxine, and she identifies as male and wants to get hormone treatments, et cetera. Her father opposed it. The court did not allow him to oppose it. And the court said, if you refer to your daughter as she or as your daughter or call her Maxine, uh, even in the privacy of your home, you'll be arrested for it. Unbelievable. Right. So we understand how far things have gone in Canada. And then it, it's been the law in New York City uh, for a few years now that if Joe comes into work and says, I'm now Jane, you're not allowed to question it. If you misgender Joe and refer to him still as Joe or he and do it intentionally, you could be fined up to $250,000. Uh, Joe must hereafter be allowed to use the ladies' bathroom, et cetera. And again, you're not even allowed to request uh, uh, proof that you're meeting with psychiatrists, psychologists. So I'm, I'm all with you in terms of the concern. And I do understand how hate crimes bills and their various groups behind them how those can then be, I understand the spirit behind them and, and why they're in place, but I understand how damaging they can be. And obviously, if you kill somebody, it's not a love crime, it's a hate crime, period. But uh, I, I want to specifically discuss why you're constantly tying, the, tying this in with, with Jewish leadership, et cetera. But go ahead, you come back to the two things you wanted to draw attention to, and we'll make sure we, we cover this subject, and then we'll We'll shift over to the Jewish role. So back to you, sir, to the points you wanted to make. Okay, the Equality Act, and the bill number on that is H.R. 5. It has been moving forward rapidly, and the House is now on the floor of the House. 
and uh, will undoubtedly be voted on, they say, sometime this week. It's basically a speech crime law. It says that uh, if your words intimidate or cause terror or disorientation or extreme stress uh, to a homosexual, that 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 in itself is an exemption to our concept of free speech mm -hmm. in in America. Yep. What what it basically says is that his test his or her testimony that they have been shattered. Let's let's say uh, let's say a, a Christian minister. Or, or a landlord, or a uh, condominium owner, or whatever. If he even says to a couple of homosexuals who want to rent that, I've got to rent under this law, but I want you to know that what you're doing is ungodly. And in fact, my Bible says it's an abomination. If they are terrorized by that, and, and they say, we were, we were shattered, we were we, we we can't live here with this hostility, but we have a right to, and, and so on. And and they and they report him to the federal government. Then the government under this bill will be obligated to make an investigation. And if they uh, tearfully make the case that they have been shattered and emotionally damaged by this. There's a very good chance that the government will side under the Equality Act, and his speech crime of basically doing nothing more than making a Christian testimony to what he regards as sexual yeah. perversion, he will become a speech criminal, a hate criminal, in America just as in Canada. Yeah, and, th and so, this has happened. Uh, we've got a break coming up. This has happened uh, in England with street preachers, for example. And I have to analyze the language of the bill more in terms of speech, but the bill, I'm just quoting from it now, the bill prohibits an individual from being denied access to a shared facility, including a restroom, a locker room, and a dressing room that is in accordance with the individual's gender identity. Of course, the Trump administration has been pushing back against this to undo what the Obama administration did. And there are cases that will even come to the Supreme Court that is, is sex, biological sex, or can it mean gender identity? So, uh, again, this is an area where, with Reverend Pike, I have grave concerns about where this could go. So one more point on the bill when we come back, and then let's talk about the role of Jewish people. I uh, take deep, deep difference. I have deep, deep differences and take offense to statements Reverend Pike has made about Jewish people. But we're going to have a dialogue about it momentarily right here on The Line of Fire. I've heard it over and over and over again. Today's Jews are not really Jews. Today's Jews are just Ashkenazi. They're converts of the Khazar kingdom. They're European. They're not really Jews. And the real Jews are either Africans or the real Jews are Christians because God's done with natural Israel. Well, well what is this based on? Some of it's based on just the latest misinformation and internet myths and things like that. Some of it's based on the good research that traces back Jewish origins and recognizes that there's been Jewish intermarriage over the centuries. That's why we come in so many different colors and shapes and forms. But, but this idea that today's Jews are not really Jews or that even if Ashkenazi Jews or other Jews are ethnically Jewish, that they're not Jews in God's sight, it's based on a misreading of Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Paul is writing in Romans, and look at what he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who are of Israel are Israel. What was the point that Paul was making? He spoke from Romans 9, 1 to 5 of the anguish that he carried in his heart, the constant pain 
and anguish that he carried in his heart for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to whom the promises of God remain. He says, theirs are, not were, but theirs are the promises, all right? But he says, well, it's not as though the word of God failed because the Messiah came and the promised nation didn't follow. Does that mean the word of God failed because God made these promises to Israel? And his first response is, no, not everyone descended from Israel is Israel. He's not talking about the church as a whole. He's not talking about the Gentile world. He's not talking about everyone else. He's saying that there is a remnant within the nation, just as he says in first, uh, in Romans 11, 1. Uh, the, the, he responds to that again and points out, hey, I'm, I'm an Israelite. I'm part of the remnant. So he's saying within the nation, there is an Israel within Israel. Revolution here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us today. I'm speaking with Reverend Ted Pike, who leads the National Prayer Network. He is a conservative activist. He also feels that Jewish people in particular are to blame for a lot of the social ills. He does not damn all Jews, but again, will interact with that. So Reverend Pike, we know that there are many different groups who want to see this bill go forward that that some hate crime legislation over the years has has been focused on race issues and attacks on black Americans, things like that. And then concerns, you know, with attacks on Muslims for being Muslims and 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 things like that and anti-Semitism and so on. But you seem to, in, in your articles here, sir, put the great onus on Jewish activists. I've, I fully recognize there, there are Jewish liberals who are at the forefront of SPLC and ADL, the groups that, that whose, whose ideology would strongly oppose. And there are the Jewish philanthropists like George Soros underwriting a lot of the, the wrong moral causes in the world today. So I have no argument with saying that there are influential Jewish leaders even on the Supreme Court, but you seem to, to put special emphasis on them. And I, I wanna interact with some quotes verbatim from you from the past, but why is it that you focus so much here on Jewish activism and, and the ADL? Why is that such a major theme for you? Well, because the ADL is the grandfather of the whole concept of hate crimes or bias crimes legislation, especially after the uh, passage of the federal hate bill in 2009, the ADL uh, strongly crowed, it, it boasted that it had been uh, the originator of, of the whole idea, and that's well documented in, in, in an article I wrote at, at that time. And I, I, I strongly object to your your uh, subtle, perhaps, but you're, you're portraying me as being anti-Jewish or and, and against the Jewish people. That is not the case. I am not against the Jewish people, but like Jesus Christ, I am against e evil Jewish leaders who lead their people astray, and I have a moral obligation, just like my Savior, to, to not have respect to persons, as James warns us, but to reprove and rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine, uh, regardless of who is in error or who is in sin. Now, I have to, I have to say well, that well, well, allow, this... uh, Yeah, allow me then just to interact, uh, because we, we, we've got to both have time to speak here. Yeah, by all means, take offense then, because yes, I do find your views, many of them to be quite anti-Semitic, and a working definition of anti-Semitism, hostility to or prejudice against Jews. Contrary to Jesus, you make false statements. He was the truth himself. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Contrary to Jesus, you make false statements. Here's a statement. Let's pull up slide number nine from your 2006 article, Judaism and Homosexuality, A Marriage Made in Hell. You say the ancient rabbis, sexual perverts, made careful permission for their deviant sexual indulgences. They repeatedly made the Talmud's text crystal clear. Boys of eight as martyrs can't throw guilt on the Jewish adult who's the active offender against them. I, I know the literature, sir. I've, I've studied Talmud and rabbinic literature. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus, so I'm in constant war with the Jewish community. I've been called public enemy number one because of our effective outreach to the Jewish community. I reject Talmudic authority, but your treatment of the Talmudic text and making the Talmudic rabbis into perverts and pedophiles is absolutely false. You downplay what you call the Jewish apologists who have other readings. I can tell you what those texts mean. I can tell you what they mean in context. And when certain things it's saying is a child who has sex with an adult culpable for the death penalty and say, no, no death penalty and things like that. But this is the type of stuff 
that creates all types of hostility and hatred towards Jewish people and, and has led to acts of violence against Jewish people through the ages. It's almost all the cl- classic anti-Semitic tropes I find in, in your, your book is, uh, on Israel that came out in 84 that I quoted extensively back in one of my 1992 books. I found those terribly troubling, and I'm, I'm all for rebuking corrupt Jewish leadership, sir. I am all for rebuking Jewish liberals that are hurting our society. I am with you. Let's do it without fear. But I wholeheartedly reject false statements about Israel, false statements about the Jewish people, misreading of Talmud and rabbinic literature that demonizes people. That's where we have our differences. Okay, let, let me just say that I have many articles complete with photostatic copies of all of these passages from the Talmud. Jesus Jesus said the rabbis, the Pharisees were full of all uncleanness, and pedophilia is an, an integral pro- part. Why does he never the accuse teaching? him of sexual immorality? Never, never once. In Matthew 23, with the seven woes against the Pharisees, why doesn't it? And can, can, you, can I just ask you candidly, can you read Hebrew and Aramaic? No, I read Greek, but not, not Hebrew. Or oh, okay, can you understand the fact you can put up photos that put up the full commentary and the full explanation? All right, these passages are easily misunderstood. For example, when the Talmud says, if a girl is violated by a man and she's not three years old, it's nothing. It doesn't mean that it's not a sin or a crime. It means that she should still be considered a virgin when she gets married, because you had days when virgins were married and days when women were married, say, who were previously married and weren't virgins. And the question is, what day does she get married on? So she's not penalized for that. And so, oh, no, Talmud says you can have sex with three years. Of course not. There's, look, I, again, I'm not a Talmudic Jew. I reject Talmudic authority. I, am in, I have a whole volume as to why I reject the Talmud. All right? Five, 300 pages uh, on that. But the, these are misconceptions. And to make the, the, ra- the ancient rabbi sexual perverts, that is a statement Jesus would not be, be. make. My, Michael, the, the the evidence is overwhelming, and, and what you're basically telling me here is the standard Orthodox Jewish subterfuge to try to whitewash these these people whom Christ called uh, sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Now, what I want to well, do— No, 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 what, no. What, what sir, sir, is, sir, hold on. That's false. It is not—see, uh, you have such evil in your heart towards Jewish people that when you see sound Jewish scholarship— that all traditional Jews on the planet will explain and understand the same way, who are as a, a, a appalled by sexual crimes and sexual sins as you are. People I know well. I mean, we interact constantly. You're claiming it's a subterfuge. I'm telling you, you're, you can't even read the text, okay, sir, well, we have a, in the original. We have a difference. But listen, listen now. What we have facing us is extremely insidious legislation. What I don't want to do right now is to waste this opportunity to, to alert your listeners to the danger of these two ADL-inspired hate bills, which are moving forward rapidly in Congress. Now, I have an article. But, but, but sir, you, you agreed to ha- – yeah. hang on, hang on. You contacted us about coming on the air. All right. No, I didn't. I, I, I didn't ask you to come on the air. I, I wanted to alert you. You contacted you contacted my producer and, about no, the no, bill. He, he presumed that I wanted to. Be uh, OK, on you. Con- All right. Would you confirm that you contacted us? We didn't contact you. Yes or no? I, I, I'm sa- I, I Did you contact us, I, I, sir? A, a little integrity. Did you contact us? Or did we contact you? Well, what happened? No, you didn't contact me. You I contacted, contacted us. You, okay. Wanting you to warn your people. I, I've been talking. I've, uh, uh, fine, fine, fine. Okay. When you were coming on, when our so our producer assumed when you contacted him, okay, that you wanted to come on the air. Either way, when we gave you the invitation, did he explicitly tell you that I differ deeply with you and oh, I was yes, going to bring these so. and that yes. you were all for us discussing them? So, sir. For years, I have been warning about issues like that. I have written more books on this probably than any evangelical leader in the, in the last 10 years. My listeners and viewers are constantly aware of the dangers of gay activism. I have said those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet. So that's why I just let you speak, all right? I let you speak freely 
to address the bills. We covered the areas here. No, we, we haven't talked about the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. That, that's working hand in glove with the Equality okay. Act to end free speech in America. Uh, but you're not. A, but, but I'm telling you, your views themselves spread anti-Semitism. I've got quote after quote from you that historically no. inaccurate, that are dangerous, that are ugly. And you won't even, you said before coming on the air, my producer explicitly called to ask, can we go there? You're not letting me go there. You're making a libelous statement about ancient rabbis being sexual perverts, and it's a it's an orthodox subterfuge to covering up. I'm telling you, you're misunderstanding the text. You're misunderstanding the Talmudic text. And I'm not a defender of the Talmud because I'm not a Talmudic Jew. You, you can't throw out these massive charges against Jewish people and then say when Jesus spoke against the corrupt leaders, he was speaking against all Pharisees. There were thousands of Pharisees who were believers. Paul identifies himself as a Pharisee in the book of Acts. You make these broad brush statements and say they're not anti-Semitic. They're terribly damaging, sir, and they're ugly and they're uh, what, wrong. What I would say is, in light of all this raft of accusations against me, people, just come to truthtellers.org. I've got article after article, thousands of footnotes for all of this out of the Talmud, out of the Zohar, the Kabbalah. You can't, you don't understand, you don't even understand what you're quoting. I'm just being candid with you. I've got a PhD in Semitic languages. I've studied with rabbis for decades. You don't, I differ with them on point after point let, let, let after the point. Let All the right, people tell, tell you what, tell you what, let me host my show. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to let you, you, you were just referred to Reverend Ted Pikes. Uh, I'm, I'm thoroughly disappointed, sir, because you made clear to my producer that you were 100% fine with us going in this direction. And now you won't let me get a point out. Here's what we're going to do. We're done, okay? You've made the point. I stand with you on the dangers of the bill. But let's, let's find out what Reverend Ted Pike actually believes. I'll, I'll read quotes without being interrupted. Sir, you are wrong. You are in error. You are spreading dangerous misinformation about Jewish people. I stand with you in rebuking corrupt leaders, Jewish leaders. I stand with you in speaking against Jewish beliefs, when they are wrong, it is not anti-Semitic to criticize Jewish people. It is not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel. But you've crossed the line many times over and thoroughly disappointed me in terms of agreeing to come on the show and now pushing back on the very subject I told you, my producer told you, we'd bring up. Nope, nope, uh-uh. What about the Talmud? Is it anti-Christian? Is it filled with attacks on Christians and attacks on Jesus? First, let's understand when we talk about the Talmud, there are two Talmuds, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. We normally refer to the Babylonian Talmud. That's the more authoritative. That's fuller. That was completed a little over 500 years after the time of Jesus, just to give you context here. Some of the traditions go back to times before Jesus. Most of it is from after the destruction of the Second Temple and then even after the Second Jewish Revolt in the second century of this era. But these traditions were passed on their debates, discussions among the rabbis about legal issues, about biblical interpretation, about life. It's this massive compilation. It, it's, it's a lifetime of study to really understand it and master it. If we stack the books of the Talmud up here, they, they'd be this high, okay? So does the Talmud attack Christianity? Is it anti-Christian? For the most part, you're just reading about Jewish law and discussions among rabbis, and there may be folklore, there may be passing references to things, but it is, it is not polemicizing against other religions or polemicizing against Christianity. However, there are certain sentiments in there that are clearly anti-Christian. Now, we can go back to John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 41. This accusation was brought against Yeshua. John 8, 41. It, it says uh, this, uh, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father. We're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. In other words, you're born of sexual immorality. This idea that Jesus was born out of wedlock, obviously a Jewish response to the claims of the virgin birth, this is found in the Talmud. It is found a few times, these references in Talmud and ancient Jewish literature, derogatory statements about Jesus, 
or alleging that that he deceived Israel, that he was a sorcerer or things like that. Those comments are there. There are few and far between. For the most part, the attitude of Talmud towards other faiths, if the people are worshiping idols, that's wrong. Uh, Christianity is looked at as a heresy, but the Talmud is not primarily polemicizing against other religions. So does it contain statements you could call anti-Christian? Of course. Is that the heart and soul of it? No, you could, you could study for days, for weeks, for months, and never come across anything like that. So to characterize it as anti-Christian can be misleading, although for sure it has some very strong negative statements in there that would point to Jesus or the first disciples. But once more, few and very, very far between disaster at ready.gov that's ready.gov a message from fema and the ad it's the line of fire with your host dr michael brown get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH here again is dr michael brown hey friends we have opened up a hornet's nest in recent months by confronting contemporary anti-Semitism, especially, especially when it comes from Christians, be it Rick Wiles on True News, be it E. Stan, e. Michael Jones, Catholic author, be it from conservative comedian, but now professing Christian Owen Benjamin, or when it comes from Reverend Ted Pike and the National Prayer Network. My intent was to have Reverend Pike on for an entire hour first discussing the equality bill, which we are both greatly concerned about in terms of those, well, it basically say those who came out of the closet pushing LGBT activism will effectively put us in the closet in different ways. Grave concerns over that. We share those concerns. However, I categorically differ with this characterization of the Jews. And our producer, Matt, spoke with him immediately before the show to make clear to him that I would be challenging his views on the Jewish people. He knew it. He understood it. He came on. When the show started to get ugly just a few minutes ago, I mean, with interrupting and with ugly false accusations made against Jewish leaders, at that point, I thought, you know, I wanted to give him the opportunity to respond to his quotes. But since he made clear he's right, I'm wrong, he can't read Hebrew or Aramaic, Yet all the rabbis who explained it are wrong. It's all subterfuge. It's all lies. I thought, nope, he's not going to have the dignity of more time on the radio to put forth lies when on my own show, I can't even get a word in to speak the truth clearly. All right. So if you missed the first half hour, by all means, go to our YouTube channel, Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K-D-R Brown, right after the show's over, it will be online ready to view also to stand with us to partner with us go to patreon.com patreon.com forward slash ask dr brown a-s-k-d-r brown help us push back against the lies of anti-semitism i'm looking at some notes in the uh, chat on youtube and uh <laughs> some of them are crazy uh, is Brown a Christian who follows Kabbalah and Talmud? Why am I defending Talmud? I'm defending lies, explaining when lies about the Talmud are being given. I am not a Talmudic Jew. I don't know how many thousands of times I have to say it. Am I wearing a yarmulke as a Talmudic Jew would? Am I keeping all the traditions of the Talmud? No. Am I a rabbinic Jew? No. Have I written a whole book explaining why I'm not? No. But when I explain when there are lies about the Talmud, suddenly I'm, I'm not a Christian. You, you would not believe all the people saying, you're not, you're not a follower of Jesus. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're just Talmudic Jew. That's how deep lies are in people's minds. And if you listen, for those who say Reverend Pike didn't get a word in, listen to the first half hour of the broadcast and see how much he spoke versus how much I spoke. The moment I challenged his views, the pushback got ugly. Here, I, I want to read this again. This is from an article of 2006. The ancient rabbi, slide number nine, the ancient rabbis, sexual perverts, made careful provision for their deviant sexual indulgences. They repeatedly made the Talmud's text crystal clear. Boys of eight as minors can't throw guilt on the Jewish adult who's the active offender against them. That is patently false. 
That is from a man who cannot read a word of the Talmud in the original language and does not understand Talmudic logic or dialectics. And if you want to say that I'm not a follower of Jesus because I defend the truth, then I question if you even know who he is. Here, I, I emailed an ultra-Orthodox rabbi who was a counter-missionary. He and I go at it back and forth, sometimes on a daily basis, about who Jesus is, okay? We are constantly opposing each other's work. I, I sent him Ted Pike's article, Reverend Pike's article, about Judaism and homosexuality with all the Talmudic quotes. Here's how he responded. At no point in the discussion about young boys is the Talmud discussing right or wrong. The Talmud is discussing the death penalty or permanent disqualification on the basis of forbidden relations, as in Leviticus 21.15. In these two situations, if the male is in relationship, if the male in relationship is a boy less than nine, the death penalty will not apply. And the woman, the woman's involved, will not become disqualified, but the act is certainly forbidden. Furthermore, the Talmud is not saying that a boy of less than nine is not included in the prohibition against homosexual relations. In such a situation, if the boy is, quote, the female in the homosexual act, the death penalty would apply. So Reverend Pike, who does not understand this, when, when rabbis explain it, he count, calls it a subterfuge to cover up their perversion. That's ugly. Here, let, let me read to you a quote from his book, Israel, Our Duty, Our Dilemma, an absolute non-scholarly book, by the way, filled with inaccuracies that I exposed back in 1992, and our hands are stained with blood. Here, here's what he says. We have unearthed irrefutable evidence that Israel is a dominant and moving force behind the present and coming evils of our day. To our amazement, we find that Israel is not that trusted, familiar friend we thought we had known. Rather, she is a misshapen facsimile of everything we had fondly bid God speed to. We are at last confronted with a monstrous system of evil, which, if unresisted, will destroy us and our children and bring the entire world into such darkness, oppression, and satan satanic dominion that only the coming of Jesus Christ can make it right again. That he's saying that the nation of Israel is going to bring the whole world into total satanic dominion. i tell you what. Join us in Israel next May, our next tour. Tour the land with us. Get to know the people. Yes, there are all kinds of problems in Israel. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. But this idea of the Jewish people are going to dominate the world and destroy it, that's classic anti-Semitism. All right? Here, slide number three. Listen, listen again, this is Reverend Ted Pike from his book, Israel, Our Duty, Our Dilemma. My plan was to allow him to respond to these, but based on the, the way of responding, being offended that I'm bringing up stuff that we told them I was going to bring up, and that's what I wanted to major on, I was not going to turn this into an ugly argument. That being said, Reverend Pike, if you happen to listen to the rest, let's have a public debate, a public moderated debate, you and me, on your charges against Israel and your charges about the Talmud. Let's do it. Let's get a three-hour debate. We'll do a live stream. We'll get it out to all of our different networks. We'll get a, a neutral moderator. We'll agree on the format, presentations, cross-examination, rebuttals, the whole bit, all right? Uh, uh, does the Talmud sanction pedophilia? Were the ancient rabbis sexual perverts, as you claim, Reverend Pike? Let's debate it, all right, in a format that will be fair and fitting for all. Here, listen to this. Even if we accept the Jewish figures of six million Jewish martyrs in the Holocaust, a figure many scholars believe to be the wildest exaggeration. So he's, he's suggesting that many scholars, he, he, is, he is giving space to Holocaust denial, okay? But he's not an anti-Semite. Remember, the rabbis are, ancient rabbis are all perverts, but he's not an anti-Semite. Let's remember that. And, and on, on top of that, when the rabbis explain what the text really means, it's just lying and subterfuge because that's what they do, all right? And maybe the Holocaust really didn't happen. But he says, even if it did, still that figure shrivels before the estimated 144 million victims of Jewish-inspired communism since 1917. We'll go back to that slide in, in a moment. But <clears throat> yes, there were Jewish leaders like Karl Marx who were influential in the formation and development of communism. And there were plenty of leaders 
Friedrich Engels and others and Vladimir Lenin and others who were not Jews. And the butchers that carried out the atrocities slaughtered Jews as well. How many Jews were, were persecuted under communism and slaughtered under communism and oppressed under communism and told they couldn't practice their religion under communism? Traditional Jews suffered like traditional Christians under communism. And was Joseph Stalin a Jew? No. And was Mao Zedong a Jew? And was Pol Pot a Jew? No. These other communist murderers, they weren't Jews. But no, Jewish-inspired communism, another anti-Semitic trope. Here, <clears throat> his video, The Other Israel, according to Ted Pike, back to slide three, a widely distributed video says that the medieval church persecuted the religious Jews because these highly moral Christians, oh yeah, persecuting Jews and killing them, were offended by the sexual perversions of the degenerate Jews. Why? Because the Talmud sanctions pedophilia and they were all practicing this and the Christians were mortified by it, so they slaughtered the Jews. You're talking about rewriting history and turning it upside down in a perverse and dangerous way. Uh, slide number five, again, from the same book, Israel, Our Duty, Our Dilemma. Both the Talmud and Kabbalah predestined the church in America to the same fate as was meted out during the last 67 years to well over 100 million Goyim Gentiles in nearly one third of the world. Death by so, so it, according, he's claiming, this is but 100% bogus. He's claiming that religious Jewish literature is calling for, look at this, the church in America, this is what's gonna happen to you, according to Jewish literature. Death by starvation, slaughter, torture, imprisonment, and exhaustion. Do not think that there is the tiniest particle of gratitude within the Zionist for the charity and money and munitions which Christians have invested in the Israeli experiment. Another lie, another demonstrable lie, all the church will ever receive from Zionism for her kindness is what Gus Hall promised Christianity in America, a bullet in the belly. Instead of being blessed in return for our blessing of the Jews, we can only anticipate from Zion generations of slavery and the worldwide gulag prison system to come. <clears throat> that's why, that's why I say demonstrable lie. The Knesset has a specific arm that is a liaison to evangelical Christians. Why? To express appreciation for solidarity with Israel. That's why Prime Minister Netanyahu is a friend of Donald Trump and a great appreciator of the solidarity of evangelical Christians in America towards Israel and America's support of Israel. That's why when you go there as a tourist, you are greeted with appreciation from Israelis who recognize America's role in standing with Israel. Even with President Trump, when we were interviewing and Matt, my producer, was there when we were interviewing religious Jews about their beliefs so we could compare and contrast and use it as an outreach tool. Some said, no, no, no. First, we talk about Trump. Make America great. Make Israel great. We like Trump recognizing the support and, and, and overwhelming appreciation for that historically. And throughout Israel, there is great appreciation for Christian love. Now, the ultra-Orthodox, where do they stand? They do not want the Christian love, and they do not want people like me preaching the gospel in their land. And if it was up to them, we wouldn't be allowed to. But it's not up to them, at least at the moment, it's not up to them. Yes, they oppose the gospel. That's true. But they are not the people that they're being painted to be. I'm going to stand for truth. You can call me whatever you want, and we're getting called every name under the sun. I wear it with a badge of honor. If the master of the house, Jesus, was called Beelzebub, what about the rest of us? Be right back. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my 
my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the, with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit, he said he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to Ask drbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, and when you go there, we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel and the Jewish people. Together, we're making a great difference. Now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the House of Israel, to share in this end-time harvest of Jewish souls, and to find out how to receive this two-DVD set, Predestination, Election, and the Will of God Debate. Go to AskDrBrown.org and click the TV. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Just looking at some YouTube comments, Ancestral Sage. Jesus talked about Synagogue of Satan. That's the Talmudic Jews. Well, he said they claim to be Jews and they're not. Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. Remember he said that the church in Ephesus, you tested those who claimed to be apostles and were not. may not have been Jews at all. Just people who claimed to be Jews and weren't. But to the extent that Jewish people oppose the gospel going to the nation, yeah, those, uh, those people could be characterized as synagogue of Satan. Like, like anyone opposing the gospel could be characterized as that. But say that's the Talmudic Jews, again, no, no, he was not saying that. So then those who are actively opposing the spreading of the gospel, the average Talmudic Jew is not even thinking about that. Uh, Finn, freak, most Israelis are classic supremacists. Um, and you know, you know most Israelis. You know most Israelis. I could just as well say most Americans are classic supremacists. Or most whites are classic supremacists. Overstatements like that. But it fits in perfectly with anti-Semitic narratives that demonize the people. How do I define anti-Semitism? Well, here, let's, let's look at Reverend Pike, all right? Let's look at Reverend Pike, slide number 11. Slide number 11. He says, actual historic anti-Semitism is easy to define. It's the racist belief that Jews are, because of genetics, degenerate and subversive. It is not, however, anti-Semitic to criticize the bad behavior of evil Jews, Jewish leaders, or the state of Israel, as did Jesus. I agree. It is not anti-Semitic, to criticize the bad behavior of evil Jews, Jewish leaders, or the state of Israel, as did Jesus. Of course, he didn't criticize the modern state of Israel. But no, that's not anti-Semitic. But anti-Semitism is not simply racist. It's not simply racist. It's not simply saying it's based on genetics. Anti-Semitism is to demonize a people, to speak of the Jews as a whole, or the Jews by spiritual nature or whatever, all right? and then to spread lies about them, to libel them, to demonize them, to paint with a broad brush, all right? So that's, that's what's anti-Semitic. And statement after statement uh, in, in Reverend Pike's writings about the Jews are classic anti-Semitic statements. You say, that's all you talk about. No, I'm just confronting it. How many shows? L listen, we've been on the air 11 years. How many hundreds, thousands of shows? It's, the last subject of my mind. I've written several thousand articles. We've got over 1,600 videos. How often am I dealing with this? I'm dealing with this because it's raising its ugly head. I'm dealing with this because it's coming up day and night and day and night and day and night, and we are confronting it. Reverend Pike contacted us. We said, all right, if you come on the show, we're going to push back. I'm thinking, why would we? He, does he not know how strenuously I reject his position about Jewish people and the way it's the, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews? Now, look, if he was just dealing with influential Jews today, all right, Catholic, Catholic scholar, 
E. Michael Jones. Yes, I believe his views are anti-Semitic, which I said when he was on the air with me. I'm surprised that he was surprised afterwards when I referenced that. Because on the air, my very first comments to him after he spoke was, this is, to me, what I characterize as anti-Semitic. When you demonize the people as a whole and broad brush them as a whole, that that is anti-Semitic. I said it right there on the show. I guess he didn't hear I was saying that about his position, but that's why I started there and then warned that words like this have led to violence historically. As much as you say no one should harm the Jews, words like this lead to violence. It was as clear as I could be. And that's why we went sure with, made sure with Reverend Pike in advance. You understand what we want to address and deal with. When you characterize Jewish literature a certain way, when you rewrite history, here's the way I describe his book, slide number eight, his book, Israel, Our Duty, Our Dilemma. This is the way I described it, and our hands are stained with blood, and I stand behind this description. From a historical standpoint, it is filled with gross errors and inaccuracies. Even the spelling of cited Jewish sources is often totally confused. In terms of Pike's evaluation of Jewish history, Judaism, and the modern state of Israel, called The Mother of Harlots, on page 279 in the 1984 edition, the book is devoid of scholarly value. And, and what bothers me is, Dr. Jones makes a lot of excellent statements, a lot of true statements about Jewish activism, especially when it breaks away from Jewish tradition. And, and, and his view is, because you're rejecting God's revelation of wisdom and truth, and therefore you become a revolutionary, my explanation is that God is specifically called and gifted the Jewish people to, to make world impact, to be world changers. When, when we get it right, it's awesome. So look at Moses, look at Jesus, look at Paul, look at all the influence that comes from Israel, from the Jewish people. As Jesus says in John 4, 22, salvation is from the Jews. When we get it wrong, be it a Karl Marx or a Sigmund Freud or a George Soros or, or, or uh, on the Supreme Court now, the liberal Jewish justices, we get it terribly wrong. So we have a lot of influence for good or for bad. I would agree with much of the cultural critique of Dr. Jones. I would agree with much of the cultural critique of Reverend Pike. If only they did not demonize Jewish people as they do and paint them as moral subversives almost by, well, if by spiritual nature, if not by blood, those are the things that concern me, and therefore I will push back. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Mike in Silva, North Carolina. Welcome to the line of fire. You're on the air, sir. Hello? You're, you're on the air. Hey, Mike. Um, I was wondering in Matthew 21, yeah. it says that the kingdom of God is going to be taken from the Jews and given to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. It doesn't say that, When though. did that happen? Yeah, it doesn't say that. It's not what it says. What's it say? Yeah, so who's the parable spoken against? All right, it's about the religious leadership. The Pharisees. The Pharisees. the Pharisees and the leaders. Okay, so here's what it says, Matthew 21, 43. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit, and the one that falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although sure. they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds right? Who are the crowds? The Jewish crowds, because they, the crowds, held them to be a prophet. So that transition happened. It was taken from them and given to the apostles and the other believers. So the leadership was taken from the corrupt leaders and given to the apostles who were all Jewish and the leaders of the early church who were all Jewish. And the Jewish crowds, they held Jesus to be a prophet. So it wasn't taken from the Jewish people and given to someone else. It was taken from the bad leadership and given to other Jewish leaders. And then from there, the spiritual leadership is Jew and Gentile through the centuries. But it wasn't taken from the Jews. Never taken from the Jews. It was taken from the corrupt leaders. It tells us explicitly. The chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables. They perceived he was speaking about them. But they feared the crowds, the Jewish crowds, because the Jewish crowds thought that Yeshua was a prophet. Well, why is the church constantly described as the Israel of God, the New Jerusalem? I mean, every it's not. It's, it's never, never, Israel never once. Never, Mike, church. never once. Never once. See, Galatians 6. Ah, so when you say constantly, Galatians 6, 16, one verse, one verse, and it doesn't refer to the church as the Israel of God. Uh, as the vast majority of translations recognize, it uses the word chi, which is and in Greek. No, 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 it's not what it says. But Mike, here, 
I, I refuted your statement about Matthew 21. Now Galatians 6, 16, peace be to all who follow this rule, speaking to the Gentiles in, in Galatia and separate entity to the Israel of God. Okay. It's two separate entities. Now, as many as live by this rule, shalom and mercy on them and on the Israel of God, which is Jewish believers in Jesus, like me, like Paul. That's the Israel of God. Paul does not call the church the Israel of God as the vast majority of translations recognize. So there's neither Jew nor Gentile in Jesus, but I imagine, sir, when you go to the bathroom, you go to the men's room, not the ladies' room, it says there's neither male nor female. But male-female distinctions still exist, just like Jew-Gentile distinctions still exist, but in Jesus, we're one. There's no caste system. There's no class system. We're equally children of God, equally branches of the vine, equally priests to God, equally loved by God, in equal relationship with God. The Jew and Gentile distinctions resist. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17 and following, that if you're called circumcised, don't become uncircumcised. If you're called uncircumcised, don't become circumcised. So side by side in the body, we have Jewish believers and Gentile believers, one in the Messiah, but not with identical calling in every respect and not necessarily living the exact same way. There's unity in our diversity. So the church is not the new Israel. It's not a biblical teaching. The church is saved Jews and saved Gentiles. We make up the eternal people of God, saved Jews and saved Gentiles. We are the ecclesia, but the church is not the new Israel, nor has the church replaced Israel. Paul writes in Romans 11, 28 and 29 that, even though Jewish people now are enemies of the gospel for your sake, they're still loved by God because of the patriarchs, but the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And that's why God will keep his word to Israel, as Romans 11:26 says in Jeremiah 31, 1 and other verses, and there'll be a national turning of the Jewish people to Jesus at the end of the age. So vast harvest of the nations and vast turning of the Jewish people, making up the glorious ecclesia, the glorious church, Jew and Gentile together in Jesus. So brother, we are one. There is nothing that separates us. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. But I'm not a Gentile. You're not a Jew. Just like my wife's not a man and I'm not a woman. There's still distinctions within the body. So I, I'd, I'd encourage you. We're, we're, we're out of time here. And sorry, I couldn't get to any other calls. But uh, I'd encourage all of you to get my book, Our Hands Are Staying With Blood. We've got a new edition coming out in September. You can wait for that. Or if you're really eager to read now, you can read the edition that's been in print since 1992. Uh, let's, let's look at the facts. Let's go through the relevant scriptures. Let's review church history. Let's find out what really happened. It, it is a, a, a horrible, false, ugly statement when Reverend Pike says that medieval Christians killed Jews because they were so moral. The Christians were so moral and they were so shocked at the sexual perversions of the Jews, they killed them. What a horrific reinterpretation, rewriting of history to take the guilt off the guilty party and put it on someone else. May God help us. May God help Reverend Pike to embrace the truth wherever it leads. 